Hello friends, welcome to my new video and today's my discussion is on sodium potassium pump. So let us start about discussion on sodium potassium pump. So first of all, what is the sodium potassium pump? So sodium potassium ATPs that is a integral membrane protein found in the cells of all the higher eukaryocytes and it is responsible for translocating sodium and potassium ion across the cell membrane utilizing ATP as a driving force. For every three sodium ion pumped out of the cell, two potassium ions are pumped in. And this transport produces both a chemical and electrical gradient across the cell membrane. And the electrical gradient is essential for maintaining the resting potential of the cells and for excitable activity of the muscle and nerve tissue. The sodium gradient is used to drive numerous transport processes including the translocation of glucose, amino acids and other nutrients into the cells. Physiologically, sodium potassium ATPase present in organs such as the intestine and the kidney that regulates the fluid reabsorption and electrolyte movement by establishing an ionic gradient across epithelial membranes. It is estimated that approximately 23% of the ATP consumed in the humans at rest that is utilized by sodium potassium pump. Sodium potassium ATPase that is a member of the P type class of active cation transport proteins of the ATPase. Then history. Sodium potassium pump was discovered in 1957 by the Danish scientist Jens Christian Sko. He was awarded a Nobel Prize for his work in 1997. Sodium potassium ions are actively transported in opposite direction across the cell membrane by means of electrogenic pump that is known as sodium potassium pump and it moves three sodium ions out of the cell and two potassium ion inside the cell by using energy from the ATP. Since more positive ion or cations are pumped outside than inside, so there is a net deficit of positive ions occurs inside the cell. It leads to negativity inside and positivity outside the cell. Sodium potassium ions are transported across the cell membrane by means of a common carrier protein and that is known as sodium potassium pump. It is also known as sodium potassium ATPS pump or sodium potassium ATPase. This pump transports sodium from inside to outside the cell and potassium from outside to inside the cell. And this pump is present in all the cells of the body. Sodium potassium pump is responsible for the distribution of the sodium and potassium ion across the cell membrane and the development of the resting membrane potential. Then about the structure of the sodium potassium pump. Carrier protein that constitutes sodium potassium pump that is made up of two protein subunit molecules and alpha subunit with a molecular weight of about one leg and beta subunit with molecular weight of about 55,000. Transport of the sodium and potassium occurs only by alpha subunit. The beta subunit is a glycoprotein and the function of which is not clear. Alpha subunit of the sodium potassium pump has got six sites. Three receptor sites for the sodium ion on the inner towards the cytoplasm means inner surface of the protein molecule. 
and two receptor sites for the potassium ion on the outer surface of the protein molecule means towards the extracellular surface extracellular fluid then one site for the enzyme adenosine triphosphatase which is near the site for sodium then about the mechanism of action of sodium potassium pump three sodium ions from the cell get attached to the receptor site of the sodium ion on the inner surface of the carrier protein and two potassium ion outside the cell bind to the receptor site of the potassium ion located on the outer surface of the carrier protein so these are the site for the binding for the potassium ion and these are the site for the binding of the sodium ion in one site for the enzyme adenosine triphosphatase which is near the site for the sodium so this is the site for binding for atpase so three sodium ions bind on the inside surface of the protein at the receptor site and two potassium ion bind on the outer surface of the protein at their receptor sites and atpase function of the protein is activated and atp splits into adp and high energy phosphate bond so the energy is liberated now this energy liberated that causes conformational changes in the protein molecule and which pump sodium ions outward and potassium ion inwards now the precise mechanism of the conformational change is yet unknown then what are the functions of the sodium potassium pump so first of all this pump helps in maintaining the concentration of the sodium and potassium ion inside and outside the cell constant normally the concentration of the sodium ion in the extracellular fluid is greater than that of the intracellular fluid concentration of the potassium ion is greater in the intracellular fluid than that in the extracellular fluid so that the sodium ion therefore tend to diffuse inward and potassium ion tend to diffuse outwards through leaky channels and this is likely to change their concentration in the extracellular and intracellular fluid now in case of the excitable tissue like the nerve and muscle the passage of the impulse that results into diffusion of the sodium ion inwards and diffusion of the potassium ion outwards so the after the passage of the many impulses the concentration of the sodium and potassium ions are likely to change in the extracellular and intracellular fluid however because of the sodium potassium pump this concentrations are maintained constant as soon as the concentration of the sodium ion inside the cell rises to a certain concentration the sodium potassium pump is activated and pumps the sodium ion outwards and potassium ion inwards and thereby brings their concentration in the extracellular and intracellular fluid back to normal level then second main function is it helps in maintaining the cell volume constant so how it occurs so inside the cell there are large number of the proteins and other organic compounds that cannot come out of the cell and most of these are negatively charged and therefore collect around them a large number of the positive ion as well so as a result the that causes a total number of the molecules to be present in slightly more number inside the cell as compared to outside 
This causes a osmotic pressure of the intracellular fluid to be slightly higher than that of extracellular fluid and which tends to cause the osmosis of the water to the interior of the cell. So unless this is checked, the cell will swell and will burst open. However, this is prevented by the sodium potassium pump. As soon as the cell size increases, sodium potassium pump is activated and causing pumping of the three sodium ion outwards and two potassium ion inwards with each cycle. So that there is a net loss of one ion each cycle in each cycle. This increases the total number of the molecules in the extracellular fluid leading to osmosis of the water from inside of the cell to outside. And this brings the size of the cell back to normal. And so the activity of this pump tries to maintain the cell volume constant. And it acts as an electrogenic pump. It pumps the two potassium ion inside the cell and three sodium ions outside the cell with each cycle. So that there is a net loss of one positive charge outwards with each cycle. And that creates a positivity outside the cell and thus creates a membrane potential across the cell membrane. Activity of the sodium potassium pump is affected as increased by cyclic AMP, diacylglycerol, thyroid hormone, aldosterone, insulin and G-actin and inhibited by low temperature, oxygen lake, dopamine, obane and related glycosides used for the treatment of heart failure. Now regulation. Sodium potassium ATPase are regulated in two ways, exogenous and endogenous. Exogenous. So sodium potassium ATPase is upregulated by cyclic AMP. Thus the substance causing an increase in the cyclic AMP upregulate the sodium potassium ATPase. This includes the ligands of the GS coupled G protein coupled receptors. In contrast, the substance causing a decrease in the cyclic AMP down regulate the sodium potassium ATPase and this includes the ligands of the GI coupled G protein coupled receptors. Then endogenous. The sodium potassium ATPase can be pharmacologically modified by administrating the drugs exogenously. For instance, the sodium potassium ATPase found in the membrane of the heart cells that is important target of the cardiac glycosides, for example, digoxin and aubain, inotropic drugs that are used to improve the heart performance by increasing its force of contraction. Rate in order to maintain the reasonable rate of the transport, the free energy of all its intermediates must be equal. If some intermediates were much more stable than the others, the stable intermediates would accumulate and thereby severely reducing the overall transport rate. Then inhibition. The pump requires binding by sodium, potassium and ATP for its operation. Therefore, if the concentration of any of these substances is too low, the pump does not function. Now, when the temperature is reduced, so and during the oxygen lake and metabolic poison like 2,4-dinitrophenyl hydrogen that prevents the formation of ATP. Then what is the clinical significance of sodium potassium pump? So certain steroids derived from the plants are potent inhibitor of the sodium potassium pump. Digitoxyzenim and obane are the members of this class of inhibitors which are known as cardiotonic steroids because of their strong effects on the heart. These compounds inhibit the dephosphorylation of the E2P form of the ATPase when applied on the extracellular phase of membrane. Now digitalis. 
Now, digitalis, that is a mixture of the cardiotonic steroids derived from the dried leaf of the foxglove plant, digitalis purpurea. The compound increases the force of the contraction of the heart muscle and is consequently a choice drug in the treatment of the congestive heart failure. Inhibition of the sodium potassium pump by digitalis leads to a higher level of the sodium inside the cell. The diminished sodium gradient that results in a slower extrusion of the calcium 21 by the sodium calcium exchanger. The subsequent increase in the intracellular level of the calcium 21 enhances the ability of the cardiac muscle to contract. So, this figure that explains the mechanism of action of digitalis. Then Aubain. Aubain is a cardiac glycosides that acts by inhibiting the sodium potassium ATPase. Once the Aubain binds to this enzyme, the enzyme ceases to function and leading to an increase in the intracellular sodium. This increase in the intracellular sodium reduces the activity of the sodium calcium exchanger which pumps one calcium ion out of the cell and three sodium ion into the cell down their concentration gradient. Therefore, the decrease in the concentration gradient of the sodium into the cell which occurs when the sodium potassium ATPase is inhibited reduces the ability of the sodium calcium exchanger to function and so that in turn elevates the intracellular calcium that results in a higher cardiac contractility and increase in cardiac vagal tone. The change in the ionic gradient caused by Aubain can also affect the membrane voltage of the cell and result in cardiac arrhythmia. Now there are certain hormones that control over the pump can be summarized as follows. So first of all, thyroid hormone that appear to a major player in maintaining a steady state of concentration of the pump in most tissue. This effect appears to result from the stimulation of the subunit of gene transcription and aldosterone that is a steroid hormone with a major effect on the sodium homeostasis. It stimulates both rapid and sustained increase in the pump numbers within several tissues and the sustained effect is due to enhanced trans transcription of the gene of both subunits. Now catecholamines that have a varied depending on the specific hormones and tissues. For example dopamine that inhibit the sodium potassium ATPase activity in the kidney while epinephrine that stimulates the pump activity in the skeletal muscle. And these effects seem to be mediated via phosphorylation or dephosphorylation of the pump. Then insulin that is a major regulator of the potassium homeostasis and has multiple effects on the sodium pump activity. Within minutes of the elevated insulin secretion, the pump containing alpha 1 and 2 isoforms have increased affinity for the sodium and increased turnover rate. Sustained elevation in the insulin causes upregulation of the alpha 2 synthesis. In skeletal muscle, the insulin may also recruit pump stored in the cytoplasm or recruit the latent pumps already present in the membrane. Now, in this figure, there are a steps that are involved in the sodium potassium pump. So, in this figure, there are a three cytoplasmic sodium that bind to pump protein. So, these are the sodium ion and these are the potassium ion and this one is a extracellular fluid and this is a cytoplasm and this is a binding site for ATP. Then second step sodium binding promotes the hydrolysis of the ATP and the energy is released during this reaction phosphorylates the pump. So as soon as the sodium 
that binds to their binding sites there is a hydrolysis of the atp and energy is released and third step is that phosphorylation that causes the pump to change the shape and expelling sodium to the outside so sodium ions are released then the two extracellular potassium bind to the pump so these are the potassium and these are the binding sites for the potassium so as soon as the potassium that binds to the um, binding sites that triggers the release of the phosphate and the dephosphorylated pump resumes its original shape so the pump protein binds atp and release the potassium to the inside and the sodium sites are ready to bind sodium again and this cycle repeats again and again so these are the steps of the sodium potassium pump and in this video you can see how the sodium potassium pump works thank you very much now if any question you write down in any in comment section so i will try to give the answer thank you